Welcome to the Ruby Wasm Kubernetes talk. Uh, I'm Kingdon Barrett, and let's get started. So this is a lightning talk, so I'm gonna try not to talk too fast, but I uh, don't want to lose anyone. There are many twists and turns here. Um, I've got these guys at the bottom that are gonna try to help keep me honest, and it seems, it seems we were already a minute behind, so. Uh, I'm Kingdon, you can find me on these social media platforms now. Um, YouTube and Mastodon. I'm a uh, developer experience member of the WeaveWorks developer experience team, uh, OSS engineer since 2021, and uh, the S is for open source support. Um, I work on Flux. I, uh, you can find me on Slack as well, um, community maintainer, and I was a Flux v1 maintainer. You can also find me at the Flux Bug Scrub, which is my weekly event. Um, we do support things there and I try to use all of our open source as deeply as possible and lean into open source solutions. This is an open source support engineer, so that's what the job does. Um, also, you can find more Flux talks. Uh, today is almost over, but we have OSS Summit things happening for the rest of the week, so uh, check out this QR code. I'll leave it up for a second, okay? And also, this is a little bit more about me. Um, on YouTube, these are the things I do. Uh, one of the things is live coding, Ruby and Kubernetes things. So that will become relevant later. Um, so what are we here for today? Uh, what is untrusted code and why do we want to run untrusted code? Um, I do not trust my own code. Uh, so that is part of the answer to the question. So um, can Wasm run Ruby is the first question I'm going to ask. And yes, it can. Uh, but after I explored the topic pretty thoroughly, I came to the conclusion I'm not sure there is a good reason to do that, at least for the purposes that I intended. So, um, do you know why you want WASM? Uh, do you know why you want to run Ruby in WASM, if that is what you want at all? Um, I'm not sure. So I think these are the reasons to use WASM. Uh, it is a secure foundation that you can build on uh, and you can build portable artifacts and you can have a degree of language independence. Uh, we'll see a little bit about how that's um, limited, especially from a Rubyist perspective. Uh, so I cannot sell you on WASM. So if you don't know why you want WASM, you're gonna have to go to another talk, but please stick around. <laughs> um, but know that if you take the WASM, I will get nothing. There's no commission for me. I am not paid by WASM. I don't know how they get their money, um, but let's find out. So why Kubernetes? Uh, well, for Flux and GitOps, those are the reasons for me. Uh, if you chose Kubernetes, you already know why you did it. It is not a simple choice, uh, but there are declarative and versioned and immutable artifacts uh, that describe a desired state. If you're new to Kubernetes, self-healing infrastructure, that's the reason why. Um, about compiled languages. So these are some compiled languages that you can use with WebAssembly. And if you're interested in using compiled languages, I promise you there's value for here as well, even if you're not a Rubyist. So uh, my history as a Rubyist, I have used Ruby since 2002. Uh, thank you, Ivan, uh, my friend at IRC who built a Ruby chatbot with me. Uh, I got my first permanent job at a company called Metrics Matrix in Rochester, New York, and my second, uh, both of these were Ruby jobs, University of Notre Dame, Office of Information Technology. That's where I live now in South Bend. Um, so why Ruby? Well, for me, I know Ruby really well now, and I can use it for most of the problems that I come across. Uh, it has great debugging experience, Bundler, I don't know other languages that have great tools like Bundler for dependency management. Ruby fibers are pretty new at this point. If you think that Ruby is a, a single threaded language, well, you're right, but fibers make concurrency pretty easy even with a single thread. And for uh, minimum viable products, I think you can't beat Ruby to get uh, your product out to market faster. So what are the types of things that we will typically use Ruby for? Uh, I think the number one answer is to run a website. Um, and probably the number two answer, subsumed by the first answer, is to connect to a database, sc maybe scrape content from the internet, build an IRC bot. There's no compiler needed. You can uh, do all these cool things. One thing, though, um, all these things are much harder in WebAssembly. <laughs> uh, so what 
did I think would be a good idea for this project? Let's build a Kubernetes operator and try to run it in WebAssembly. Uh, well, why not? So here's where I started looking. I, I realized that Ruby is an interpreted language after some of the things that I went through, and that makes performance in WebAssembly a little bit difficult because you not, never actually compile the Ruby. So you have to bundle it with a full Ruby interpreter. So if you thought you were gonna build a small WebAssembly and uh, well, you have to pack your Ruby code in with it um, because the VFS, the way the VFS works, this is not for the web. You're gonna send a 35 megabyte file so they can run a 600 byte Ruby script. That's silly. Uh, but these are some gems that you can check out that will help you get started in WebAssembly and Ruby. Um, Wasmer, Ruby, and WasmTime. These are the gems that I use to produce the examples here. And you will run WebAssembly in Ruby. That's what I think you will do. Uh, so what is a WebAssembly? It is a runtime format, and you can build applications with it, and you can build libraries with it, and you can include them in other programs. Um, so this is what I really thought would be a cool thing to try. Why not run Ruby in WebAssembly in Ruby, just to see if it will work? I could not make it work. Uh, so let's try something else. So WebAssembly uh, is... I didn't think that, I, I did not know WebAssembly going into this talk. I had to learn how does it work, and those examples are great. Uh, Wasmer, I found, had the best set of examples, I think. So these are the types of things that you'll do with WebAssembly. If you're not familiar with WebAssembly, you can call functions that are in your WebAssembly library. You can uh, export a function to the WebAssembly library, so you can call it from there. You can ship memory around. You can use a compiler. I was looking for hello world. This is really <laughs> a lot. but. There's a thing called the system interface, uh, WASI. That is very helpful, and I found that helped me solve a lot of the problems that I encountered when I was trying to use WebAssembly with Ruby. So what is a system interface? Well, systems are file systems or standard I.O. Those are pieces that uh, are not part of WebAssembly natively, uh, or remote connections. So these are things that you can get through uh, runtime environment for WebAssembly. So um, WAGI is an extension off of WASI that basically uh, you use it as a web server, but you offload the responsibility of handling connections to another process. So um, these are things that you cannot do in WebAssembly, in my experience, and I hope that someone corrects me if I'm wrong, but uh, there's no string type, and that is a tough limitation if you're trying to work with WebAssemblies and Ruby. Um, you have to use numbers and well-defined data structures only. That's very hard. You have to allocate memory, you have to make pointers, you have to pass pointers with uh, string size if you really want strings. I don't want to do any of that. So I decided to use uh, not WebAssembly as a library from Ruby, I decided to use WASI instead. So I needed strings, I reverted to WASI, and we can parse the output of our WebAssembly. We can pass in a file in a, a file system directory. Those are examples that you'll find in the WASMR and WASMTIME examples. So let's try to solve a real problem with WebAssembly and Ruby. What is SPIN? Uh, this was my first entry point to WASM. And it is basically, uh, the marketing material all says it's a serverless thing. You all know serverless is not a thing. Um, it runs somewhere, but what does serverless mean in the WASM context? It means that you will shut down when you're done. I think that is where you get most of your performance gains from WASM, by not running it when you're not using it. Uh, you also, in spin, you can test locally. There's no Kubernetes needed. You don't need to link uh, your WASMs together. It works sort of like if you're a Rubyist, a controller, uh, or a router if you're not. Uh, so you can map web assemblies to particular paths, and you can call them from each other. You can call them from the website that you serve up. So we're gonna serve up a website, right? Uh, so where are we gonna run it? Well, we're not gonna run it on Fermion Cloud because this is Open Source Summit. Actually, this is not Open Source Summit. Um, this is GitOpsCon. Uh, but uh, we're not gonna run it on Hippo Factory either because we already have Kubernetes. And <laughs> if, if you try to sell me a Hippo Factory after, <laughs> are you serious? Come on. Uh, Hippo Factory is the open source version of Fermion Cloud. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So we're gonna run it on Kubernetes. This is GitOpsCon, after all. And these are the things that we hope to gain by using web assemblies. We want testability, um, reusability, type safety between our languages. Maybe that one doesn't apply so much in Ruby, but uh, 
we have the capacity for polyglot teams to work together with WebAssembly. That's what this buys us. So if there are specializations, if there are things you can do especially well or especially easily in a different language, you can access those things. If there's another team that uses that language, they don't know your language, you can work with that team. This is great. So I built some things. Um, and I did this to help me break my misconceptions and understand what I was doing. And I uh, tried to follow some good examples. Like I said, Spin is a great example. They have tons of examples for Ruby, and they will help you understand the limitations. If you read every document from Spin, I think you will not regret a second of that. So how are we going to use it to solve a real problem now? Uh, well, this is a problem that we have in my organization. We need to know how many downloads uh, we, we use OCI packages to publish our software. And GitHub has a number on a page that tells you exactly how many downloads at that moment in time, um, but it doesn't seem to be exposed on any API. So if we clicked on this link, we would see that number. I need that number. We're going to parse it from the HTML. Easy. So I built an EKS cluster. You can find the definition for that here. Um, I built a blog service. It does not run Ruby, uh, but this is one of the spin examples. It's called taking Bartholomew for the spin. Um, Bartholomew, if you haven't read the spin docs, is spin's uh, blog example. It's, it's really nice. It's like comparable to Jekyll or Hugo. And I wrote a Helm chart, um, and I began to understand why, why there is pain. Um, Fermion. If you don't know the history of Fermion, uh, Fermion was founded by a guy who was at Azure, and uh, before that, he was at Deus, and they are Kubernetes people, that was my impression, at least for a long time, uh, but they're not using Kubernetes, and they're not using Helm. They actually invented Helm. Um, Matt Butcher is what I'm talking about. And uh, so I said, all right, we're going to build an operator, and I followed the examples until I thought I knew everything I needed to know. And here's what I wound up building. Um, so in Ruby, we're going to fetch from the URL, we're going to write it to a file, we're going to pass in that file system context to a WebAssembly. That WebAssembly is written in Rust, uh, and that is an HTML parser. And then uh, we're going to return a number, but we're going to do it as a string, because I want to parse a string. And that's WebAssembly, uh, WASI, right there. That's what we're using for that. Uh, so once we parse the number, since this is a Kubernetes operator, we're going to store the number we parsed in uh, status in the CRD. So there's a CRD. If you go through this example, um, you'll find out about that. And we'll come back and retrieve that data later from the status of the CRD. So um, writing an operator in Ruby, actually super easy. This is the gem. It has a wonderful example. It's about one page long if you've ever tried to learn controller runtime. It's a bit longer, the controller runtime book, than one page. Um, this was so easy. And it works. And it's based on a library called KubeClient, which also works. And it works in a delightful way. And it is well maintained. If you look at the Kubernetes operator, that's not maintained. It hasn't been updated since 2021. But KubeClient is maintained. It has uh, server-side apply only, which is great. And Flux uses server-side apply, too. If you don't know what that is, um, you can apply a Kubernetes YAML and then wait for the things in it to become ready uh, before you close your connection, get a response. It's not asynchronous anymore. This is great. Um, so that is all, almost, uh, except that there is so much more. And if you are here for tomorrow, there will be a longer version of this talk with uh, actual code that we can see. You can click on all those links uh, or follow the links one way or another, and there will be a third demo on uh, Thursday, where we won't be using Ruby at all. It will be Go and TypeScript. I have a co-presenter for that. Uh, and by the way, the operator that I talk about is about 98% finished. We're going to finish it tonight. Um, we'll find out how it went tomorrow. And um, the progress I have is about 98%. So uh, I did it live on YouTube. I'm going to do the rest live on YouTube as well. If you have uh, any feedback to provide, or if you're interested, uh, you can make the demo tomorrow with me. Um, this was my first Rust app, so uh, Spin and, and Wasm inspired me to learn a little bit of Rust. I think that was pretty cool. Um, so thanks for coming, and uh, please visit us for the rest of the week if you're here for OSS Summit. And here are the slides, 
and there's a QR code you can follow if you want to find the slides. And that's it. Thank you.